Hi, I'm Brownfield News Anchor reporter Megan Grebner. Welcome to the DeKalb Asgrow Yield Advantage Hangouts. Today we have Gary Cantrell, who's a farmer in Clayton, Illinois, and Lance Tarchioni, DeKalb Asgrow technical agronomist based in West Central Illinois. Thanks for being with us today, gentlemen. We're going to cover several topics, including highlights from this past growing season, harvest results, and planning for 2017. So let's get started. Gary, let's start with you. Give me an overview of your farming operation and tell me a little bit about your farm. I uh, farm 1,400 acres. I'm typically a 50-50 rotation. The last few years, we've kind of leaned a little bit more to corn, but uh, we kind of let the whatever factors dominate it. Uh, we're... Uh, my farming operation is just about 30 miles from the Mississippi River over by Quincy, Illinois. And the unique thing about us is we're between the Illinois and the Mississippi River. So our weather can change in a minute and we don't know how things are going to come out. So, uh, but uh, I'm not your typical farmer. I uh, was a director of operations for a phone company for 38 years and I farmed and I just retired this, this past March. So now I'm getting the full enjoyment of being able to farm full time and do the things that I truly have a passion for. Well, I'm excited to learn more uh, about some of uh, your experiences in 2016. Lance, let's talk about some of the challenges that farmers throughout Illinois faced during the 2016 growing season. Well, it's, it, it's always challenging to talk about uh, Illinois as a state because it is such a diverse state and we had, uh, you know, Southern Illinois was extremely wet. Uh, early on, uh, a good portion of central and uh, northern Illinois was uh, was very dry early in the spring. So, uh, Illinois being the size that it is and covering the, the diverse geography that it covers, it uh, there's a lot of different environments in the state. But uh, generally speaking, we, we had a very mild and wet winter uh, that gave way to an extremely dry spring. And uh, especially in my part of the state and where, where Gary's at as well, uh, we were exceptionally dry in April, May, and June. Um, we're starting to resemble 2012. People thought they were going to lose their crop and, and a lot of pessimism uh, till the, the end of June when we finally started to get some rain. Uh, that gave way to what ended up being a, a record wet uh, July and August in a lot of the state. And, uh, and then that rolled into a uh, a relatively normal fall. We kind of dried back out in time for harvest, so we didn't have a tremendous amount of difficulty getting crop out of the field. Um, but it was it was certainly a, a variable year from a moisture standpoint. Temperature-wise, it was pretty normal. And uh, in spite of the <clears throat> wide swings in weather from times to really wet at times, it, it ended up being a, a very good year for, for crop production um, on, across the state, as a, at least as an average. Lance, how do those um, weather conditions, you talk about that mild uh, winter, a dry spring, and some of the other uh, weather issues impact disease pressure or, or contribute to disease pressure during the growing season? Well, it, it had a major impact on, on a lot of diseases. Most of our diseases are, are favored by high moisture conditions early in the season. That's what gets them started, what kicks them off. And and, and a lot of the state really didn't have very ideal weather conditions for disease development uh, early in the season. And so, you know, until, you know, I'm going to say July, um, we really didn't see um, much disease developing uh, in the corn crop. Um, certain parts of the state that had more moisture early, you know, had pretty good conditions for sudden death to, to develop. Um, but really, the, the the dryness that we experienced in in my part of the state in April, May, and June really ended up being a benefit from a, a disease prevention standpoint. Um, wasn't necessarily um, optimal for for crop growth and development at all times, but um, we, we really didn't have as much disease pressure uh, as a result of that dry weather. Thanks, Lance. Gary, as you look back and maybe reflect on 2016, were there any specific growing conditions uh, that caused any challenges in your area last year? Well, so as Lance uh, stated, we have a lot of variables in Illinois and our uh, uh, typical location, but it seems like in this area, everyone gets more antsier and plants earlier. We had a lot of corn plant in March. I personally did not do it, um, but uh, then all of a sudden, those that did looked like at that point that was the right decision. We experienced the dry weather. 
Uh, I planted corn at two and a half inches, probably over the majority of my crop, and I have never planted that deep to get it up, and it ended up being the right thing to do. So, um, but we did, we experienced, uh, I hit myself personally farm within about a 10 mile area and there was several places that didn't get rain. Most of my rains came out of the east this year, which is very unique. And we had ideal weathers, but it did create some disease problems. Um, our biggest problem was that we got the corn in, got it planted, started to emerge and come up and then we had a cold snap. So we had a, a lot of things that um, kind of threw us for a curveball. We were feeling good, then we felt bad, then the weather um, started to come around. Corn grew really fast. Um, we had experienced a uh, two week period of a lot of rain with winds. It looked like it just rolled the corn down. Um, thankfully, our hybrids are so much better they came back. And then for me personally, um, Scout, look, I was worried about the diseases. Um, didn't feel like it was a real problem, but yet I was concerned. And he said, well, it's a 50-50 shot. And I said, if it's 50-50, I can break even, we're going to do it. And uh, it ended up being a very good move for me personally, but I, I can't say for the others, but I know it was for me personally, it was. Lance, let's talk a little bit about corn. How did DeKalb corn products perform this year uh, throughout the Illinois growing season? Um, I'm very pleased with the performance of our portfolio this year. Uh, I think we had one of the stronger years we've had in, in the past few years. Uh, a lot of current products uh, having uh, very strong performance years. We had uh, three new hybrids that we introduced that, that were all um, exceptionally good this year. And, and it's, it's always nice when, when new products are, are winning, winning yield trials. That's kind of the way we uh, expect it to work and hope it to work. And, um, you know, it's always, uh, it's always good when, when things do well, but it uh, tends to work a little bit, a uh, little bit more smoothly when the newer products are doing better. And um, a couple of our new, uh, new release hybrids this year that you know, we'll be talking about probably as we get on through the interview because they happen to be disease shield products, uh, DKC 64, 34 rib brand blend and DKC 66, 74 rib brand blend um, were, were typically either first or second uh, in, in a lot of trials this year. So a lot of excitement around those two new products, but uh, there were a lot of the current products that had very strong performance years as well. So it's to have a, a really deep portfolio of products and, and uh, I feel that's what DeKalb has to offer today. Gary, how were the season long performance of your DeKalb corn? Um, I'm playing 100% DeKalb and uh, I was, um, for me personally, my yields were within three to five bushel in every field I went in. Um, you know, I've done a lot of going around over the years and last five, five years, I've probably stayed focused on DeKalb and, um, they just yield and things, uh, just, the, just the confidence level of knowing what you put out there is going to be there for you at the end. Um, you know, in the old days of farming, you never knew if you had a good number or a bad number. Sometimes that was a home run and that was like, oh, we planted that one one too many years. So um, for me, um, my local DSM is very good working with me to help me get the numbers that I want. I didn't get the disease shield numbers and some of those other things, but for, the, for what it turned out for me this year, I guess maybe I lost a little extra money, but overall my, I was very happy with what I had. When you look at the production and, and, and uh, the capability of products, um, what about a, when we talk about emergence, um, did, were products emerging well and, and providing yield benefits on that side of things? Well, I'm a little different than a lot of them. You know, I always say so much of this factor is how you put it in and, how you, and what you do to prepare for it. Um, I still gonna, I'm still going to favor DeKalb because I know what it does for me, but you know, there's so many things that can be variables in that that contributes to it. And it's not, um, when I, I'm a city guy that became a farmer and self-learned, so it's not the old days of just going out there and doing it. I tell everybody it's, it's uh, doing the physical work, it's a decision process. And it's not just one thing, it's a lot of things, but it's, it's awful nice to know that you can put that product out there that you can depend on and it's going to, it's going to do what you want it to do. Are we going to have, seems like I think Lance can contest that we have some ideal growing conditions and then all of a sudden we go through a cold wet snap and kind of sets us in a kind of in a funk, if you can say that. And, and then all of a sudden it goes. And uh, so for me personally, the, just the consistency, I, I just um, feel very comfortable with the products that we're, we're getting today. 
Thanks, Gary. Lance, let's talk some uh, some about soybeans. Um, how maybe an overview of how Astro soybean performed in Illinois last year? Sure. It um, you know we're we're still waiting for the, the the final state average yield to come in, but we're very likely going to shatter our previous Illinois state yield uh, record in soybeans. So it was a it was a very good soybean year in the state of Illinois. That's kind of an understatement. A lot of growers harvested the best soybean crop they've ever had in uh, in 2016, and so our Asgrow products performed uh, exceptionally well in that high yield environment. Um, in some some parts of the state where you know where we didn't have record setting yields, we we still had very good performance and consistency from the Asgrow uh, lineup. Um, you know, parts of the state where we had more sudden death pressure, more disease issues. Uh, the the plant health that uh, that we have in in those Asgrow products uh, help protect uh, that yield potential. So we had a lot of you know, a lot of our current Roundup Ready to Yield products that were, you know, very well as as we would expect them to, and and quite a few of the new Extend uh, Roundup Ready to Extend products um, that were out in both trials and a limited basis in in commercial fields uh, had exceptional performance as well. So. We feel like we're we're in a really good spot. You know, if if a grower is happy with uh, with his current run of pretty two uh, offering, we've we've still got a good offering there. If he's uh, interested in, in your Asgrow soybean fields do this season, and how do they perform at harvest? Okay. Um, go ahead, Nate. No, go ahead, Gary. Mine. I'm sorry, I glitched there, so I wasn't sure if you were speaking to me or, or to Lance. So go, go ahead, Megan. I think she was asking you. Oh, okay. uh, Sorry, we had a little latency. So for me personally, um, I, I concur with what Lance said. Um, probably had some of the best uh, individual yields for overall yield. I have never experienced an overall yield that I had this year. So um, I think we were right at 73 bushel on a little over 700 acres. So uh, for me personally, we we had a phenomenal yield. We did have a little sudden death that showed, but it never really came to fruition that, to the point that it impacted us on yield. Um, our biggest challenge was, and I think Lance can probably attest to this, is the beans grow as three-fourths as tall as the corn. Uh, we had a little lodging. We probably lost some beans there, um, but, you know, we're still going to take what we got and be very blessed and thankful for what we did get this year. And for me personally, um, it's just been a phenomenal growing year, yield year. Lance, turning to 2017, DeKalb will introduce DeKalb Disease, Disease Shield Corn. Can you give us uh, an overview of that product lineup? Sure. Um, disease Shield hybrids uh, combine uh, very high levels of disease resistance to multiple important uh, foliar diseases of corn, along with um, some of our highest yielding genetics and, and our most elite seed treatments. So it's a it's a really nice package of uh, disease resistance, uh, high yield potential, plant health, and, and then we kind of top it off with, uh, uh, with our enhanced disease control seed treatment package. And you know, what makes the disease shield hybrids unique um, in their disease resistance is, you know, there's five particular specific diseases that, that we feel are, are the most important diseases in corn. Those would be gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, Southern rust and stock rot and Goss's wilt, and not all five of those diseases are important to you know every farmer in Illinois every year, but all of those diseases do occur from time to time uh, in Illinois, and and the thing that makes the disease shield hybrid unique is that um, you know they have a very high level of disease resistance to all five of those important diseases. And uh, so we're very excited about the, the introduction of that, uh, those products this year. You know, Gary had mentioned earlier that uh, he, he hadn't had a chance to plant those this year. Well, really, no, nobody did. They were just in plots in 16, uh, performed exceptionally well in, uh, in trials. And, um, and those are available commercially for the first time for planting in 17. Monsanto's Extendamax with Vapor Grip Technology Dicamba herbicide has received EPA and Illinois State approval for use with Roundup Ready to extend soybeans. Lance, how will that provide Illinois farmers with a new weed control tool? 
Well, it's, it, it's just that, Megan. It's a, it, it is a great new tool to, to add to the, to the toolbox. And uh, as soybean weed control has gotten more difficult the past few years, um, you, you can't have too many tools to, to, keep, uh, to keep weeds down in, in soybean fields. So, you know, I've, I've been in this business long enough to have been around when we launched Roundup Ready technology 20 years ago. And, um, you know, we think the, uh, the launch of the Extend system uh, is going to be every bit as much of a, a revolution in weed control as the original Roundup Ready trait was. So having, uh, having Dicamba to be able to work into that system um, to give us, you know, an opportunity to, to have better control of some of the tough to control broadleaves, especially those that are developing resistance, uh, things such as water hemp and, and Palmer amaranth in the south and and uh, mare's tail and and um, some of the other species that uh, that we that we struggle with from time to time, uh, just giving us a, a, a very good um, tool to give us a high level of control with uh, with good crop safety and um, an excellent yield that comes along with the uh, with the extend germplasm. Uh, we think will make that a a very uh, you know very popular, very successful system, and and we're very excited to finally be able to. To uh, get that in the marketplace uh, next year, Gary. As we head into 2017, what did you learn from this past growing season, and how does that help you maybe prepare uh, for the next season as well? Well, I think I continue to be encouraged and uh, impressed with the way the yields and varieties uh, are uh, the yields that are coming from the varieties. Their vigor. I think that was very obvious this year. Lance talked a little bit about the beans and the weeds and those type of things, but um, you know, on the flip side, everything has a cost of doing business and, you know, we have to be continue to be uh, profitable. So for me, uh, I'm a little different than a lot of farmers. It has to be about yield because at the end of the day, when you look at any other business, what do they do? They do it by volume, which is for us as yield. And um, one of my favorite sayings is, is just costs as much just to raise a bad crop as a good crop. So we have to look at it more as a business and we have to look at those margins and it has to be yield. So um, for me, uh, this is the first year that I'm gonna be able to take data and figure out what I what I did right and what I did wrong and try to do that. Um, the seed side of it, this is not an environment that we need to be making a lot of changes. You gotta stay with what you know because we can't afford any oh, oh shoot moments. So. Um, um, for me, I'm going to stay the course and stay with the products that I know. Um, am I going to try the new exciting products? Absolutely. When they're available, I think they bring us a lot of promise. But uh, that those are things that I'm for, focusing on for 2017. Um, I think we're all in for a little tough period here. So we just got to make sure we do the right things and stay profitable or at least break even. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Lance, based on the experience, um, what in from maybe this growing season and, and your experience, um, what should farmers consider when they're making decisions for 2017 and what's top of mind? Well, I think Gary's comments around, you know, risk management and, and controlling costs and, but not at the expense of yield are, are very appropriate. Um, you know, your, uh, your cost of production, uh, typically the number one factor driving cost of production is yield. And uh, anything we do to trim costs without sacrificing yield um, can improve the bottom line. But if we start trimming costs and, and at the expense of yield, um, that's very likely not to improve your bottom line. So as we're looking for, for things we can save money on, ways we can reduce expenses, we need to make sure we're not cutting in areas that will, will sacrifice yield. Uh, I think we need to be, you know, managing our, our crop rotations going into next year. I think there's going to be some some unique things going on. There's there's probably going to be some second year beans out there in areas that that's a little bit uncommon. Uh, at least we'll see more of that than we normally do. Probably going to be less corn on corn uh, than there's been um, typically, but that's still going to be a system that uh, the guys are going to be using. So we're going to have continuous corn. We'll maybe have some continuous soybeans. We'll have a lot of rotated acres like we always do and, and trying to get the right product on the right acre and get them positioned appropriately. Um, in addition to that, you know, planting a, a good package of diverse products. Uh, you know, Gary mentioned sticking with what you know. 
and and having you know having a lot of um, diversity of products out there. Uh, we we really never know what Mother Nature's going to throw at us. Uh, this year we had some extreme conditions that that kind of all rolled up into a really great year. Um, you know, if we'd have been a little hotter at certain times, or if we'd have been a little drier longer, if we'd have been as wet as we were in, in July and August and May and June, it would have been a totally different um, outcome. And so being, being prepared for, for whatever Mother Nature throws at you that you can hopefully maintain the, the highest yield possible, uh, I think needs to, be, needs to be a goal. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Um, here's to a, a great 2017 growing season. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. To find out more information, talk with your local DeKalb ASGRO dealer or visit DeKalb.com and ASGRO.com. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield.